Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Law of Attraction, and it is part of God's Law series. It was presented in Gothenburg, Sweden, on the 7th of July, 2012. This is Session 1, Part 2. Okay, have a nice chin wag, is what we'd say in Australia, <laughs> which involves eating and talking at the same time. Yeah. Okay, shall we proceed with the subject? How's everyone finding it so far, all right? Need more positive feedback, what you can change. So, sick of hearing the negative things about law of attraction. <laughs> already got that. <laughs> Well, this is the positive part, isn't it? Like, how does the law of attraction help me refine our condition of love? You know, that's really what, what we want to do. And in fact, uh, is there a reason why you want to... Before we go ahead with that subject, you can use the microphone. Um, since we talked about the, the, the children coming yep. into this uh, world, yep. Um, uh, since they don't have a past life, Yep. Um, uh, why do they attract these uh, two parents? Uh, it, well, the real question is why do these two parents attract that particular no, soul? No, uh, I, I want to say why does this child attract these parents? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd say it the other way around. Why yeah. do these two parents attract this little soul, this little person here? And the real answer to that question is also about love. These parents, for them to grow in love, they need this child more than they need any other child. The personality and nature of this child in its pure condition will help these two parents grow in love more than any other child that they could have attracted would have. That's the reason why they attracted them. Far away? But um, then it must be an abuse on the child. What's an abuse on the child? Um, if um, these parents um, are very abusive, then they abuse the child. And the well, chi child hasn't done anything. Well, these parents have... The, the, correct. These parents have a choice, do they not? This is the choice they have. Do they wish to refine their condition of love? Do they wish to get more loving? Or do they wish to be worse? Do they get, wish to be more unloving? They have a choice. Every single person has a choice. And these parents have a choice. So these parents are faced with this choice when they bring this child into the world. Are they going to choose to actually develop in love towards the child and therefore have to change themselves? Or are they going to choose to not change themselves and to force the child into their way of looking at things and their way of conceiving the world and their way of doing things and their way of being unloving? Now, most parents, unfortunately, choose the second. They, they choose the latter. They choose to act unlovingly towards their newly incarnated child, unfortunately. But they don't have to. They could actually choose to exercise their will in a loving way towards the child and therefore grow through the experience of the child. This child is the perfect child to help those parents become more loving. This child is the best possible personality, the best possible individual that of all the different children they, those particular two parents could have, this particular child is the best person that they, that they need to grow more loving. But then it's really up to the choice of the parents of what do they do. Now they can choose to become more unloving, which would actually be abusive towards the child, or they can choose to become more loving. Now, I recommend that every parent chooses to become more loving, but, but unfortunately, we often avoid love as parents just as much as we avoid love in other aspects of our life. So then the child doesn't have any choice? Well, when the child incarnates, um, of course it doesn't have choice because it doesn't even know how to make a choice. Before the child incarnated, it had no idea about will, it didn't know how to exercise its will. 
it didn't know itself, so it didn't know itself, it didn't know its personality, its own nature, its, you know, what kind of characteristics it has and uh, what, kind of, what kind of feelings it had. It, it has yet to have any, no, it has no experience, right? So it has to incarnate in order to gain these things. So it has to incarnate into some parent. Now, the way God's done it is that uh, God's done it in such a way that it incarnates to the parents who need that child the most in terms of need that child in order to help them become more loving. That's how God created the system. So, so, this is, so it always gets back, and this is something I feel most audiences avoid. We are so focused on something God doing as being unfair when God didn't create the unfairness, we did. Right? This child getting abused is only created by the parent's choice to abuse it. Right? It's not created by anything else. And quite often this is what we don't focus on. What we do as parents is we want to constantly disclaim our responsibility towards the child. But the reality is this child was the perfect child to help us work through our unloving emotions and become closer to God, closer to each other, closer to other people in the world. And so this child is the perfect individual to help us through that process. And what do we do with it? Instead of accepting it as that gift of being the perfect person to help us go through all of these emotions, when it gets sick or when it does certain things or different things happen to it, we blame the child. And we say, oh, and then we come up with even belief systems that blame the child. Belief systems such as reincarnation, which actually do blame the child. Right? It blames the child for making the choice. The reality is the choices were made by these parents. Let's, let's forget about the child for a moment. It's the parent's choice to be unloving that creates the damage for the child. That's what creates the damage. And what we need to do as parents is go, no, hang on a sec. We've got to stop blaming the child and start looking and taking responsibility for our own actions in terms of what's going on here. That's what I feel most of us avoid. And what we do, we even create belief systems that avoid it in order to avoid our personal responsibility towards the child. Yeah? Does that, that help? Um, I, I want, want to add, um, because we have a big universe and lots of planets. Yes, and there yes. may, might be other civilizations. And you said that um, from 1962 it was impossible to reincarnate in, on the Earth. On this planet, on, yes. On this planet. Um, could it be um, so that um, 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 other uh, individuals from other planets reincarnate here now after... 1962 or... Uh no, they're all separated by every sphere uh, that we've been discussing. Uh, um, I've talked to... I've done some interviews recently with some people about the universe and how it's constructed. And it's basically constructed each universe, because there are many, many of them. And so the entire universe is made up of each... of lots and lots of different universes. And rather than me getting into it in a discussion about uh, the law of attraction, um, I can just give a brief summary, and that is that that each universe has its own pool of souls, if you like, that incarnate into that universe. And so if you are going to what you call reincarnate, and reincarnate is not the right term for it really because um, it's, a, it's a connection to a different body even while you're maintaining connections to other bodies. So it's not actually the same as what you would call reincarnation. The, the reincarnation teachings that you have called reincarnation, you know, that you would have heard of, are not the same thing that I'm claiming. Um, and in fact, the reincarnation teachings that are taught on this planet are all false, actually. Um, they, they, and, and you learn about how false they are as you pass through the spirit world, generally. But uh, those beliefs are all often surrounding desires on the part of people on the earth to be attached to the earth. In other words, they want to believe that they can come back to this earth and have another life so that they can fix up the last life that happened that wasn't too good, right? And they want to believe that over and over again. Now my beard is scraping on my mic. And um, they want to believe that, that they can come back over and over again to fix up the past. But the reality is you don't have to come back to fix up the past. 
what you need to do is right now, the way to fix up the past is very simple. Right now, make a choice that's more loving. That's how you fix up the past. Right now, make a choice that's more loving. Right now, make a choice that's more truthful. Don't wait for some future event to do that. Do it right now. And, and the reality is, unfortunately, that the teachings of reincarnation have a tendency to encourage you to put off the right now and, and in fact, delay your progression. Many of the people who believe in reincarnation on earth pass into the spirit world and they try to reincarnate to people back into earth, find they cannot, and then they spend many, many years in the spirit world, unfortunately, in a, in a very strong feeling of, of rage and, and anger about the fact that they can't come back to earth and that they only had one chance here, is the viewpoint. Now, you don't only have one chance here, but you do have to question why you're so focused on earth when every single universe that is above this earth in terms of dimensional space is more complex, more beautiful, more experiential, more um, enjoyably, enjoyable emotionally. So why would you be so create, create belief systems that want you to be constrained to the earth? You've got to e examine... We've got to examine the reasons why we do things, even why we create belief systems. And, and it's interesting when you talk to the spirits about these things, because when you talk to them, many spirits come to you who still believe in reincarnation, but they've never been able to reincarnate. And then when you talk to them about that and why they haven't and what's going on, then they realise that the whole belief system has flaws. And then once they realise that, then they start progressing in the spirit world to more lovely conditions that are all to do about love. And, th and this is what I'm saying, is in the end, this is all about refining our condition of love. True spirituality is about refining your condition of love. That's all it's about. It's really, that's, that's the pinnacle of real spirituality, just refining your condition of love. And, and that's what we need to bear in mind with this. So, so we need to understand that the whole reason why these parents attract a little child is so that these parents can refine their, their love. So they le learn more about love that they didn't know and that they couldn't know without this child being involved in their life. Right? And so every child, and remember, this child is not your child. It's not your child. You just created the bodies for it. The child was already created as a soul, living in the, in the soul-based worlds of, this, of, the, of the spirit world, and waiting to incarnate so that it can learn about its own will, learn to know itself and learn to have an experience. That's the whole reason why it's coming. And this child is the perfect person to help you work through your love issues as well, on top of that. This, this child is going to teach you things about God. It's going to teach you things about the universe that you didn't know, not because it knows them, because it doesn't, but because its very personality and nature will trigger you to get to know those things. Just automatically, its personality will expose these things to you. That's the beauty of the system. So I, I feel the truth is always very beautiful. And, and it's always very loving, it's always very honest, it's always very simple and, and all of those things as well. But the beauty of this system is that if these parents examined it from that perspective, instead of saying, I own this child, how many of you believe in your ch child? Yeah, we, we even say it, don't we? We say, I have three children. <laughs> what? You have three younger brothers or sisters who are not your children. They are God's children. <laughs> they are your brothers and sisters. They're not yours either. They don't, you don't own them. You don't control them. You temporarily are involved in their life. And, and oftentimes they feel like it's far too long a time that they're involved in your life, unfortunately. Now, if we learnt to love these children 
and to care about these children and honour the fact that they didn't have any will and they're learning about their will and they didn't know themselves and they're learning to discover themselves. They didn't have any experience and now they're having one and we honour that. And we also honour that this child is my brother or sister, not my child. It's, it's, it's a person who is potentially going to be even more powerful than I am. Potentially, because it's my brother and sister and he may choose to do more powerful things than I'm choosing to do. And he may do it by the time he's five. Because right? that's the potential of every one of these children. When I honour that, then I start to refine my love. And in the end, the refining of my love is true spirituality. That's the whole reason why God made this entire system, so that we would come to know love. And in particular, so that we'd come to know God's love, in fact. That's why God did that. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah? So, so when you look at it that way, you start seeing every interaction with your children, rather than being something where, oh, the children... Like, I've heard parents say this. Yes, I have treated my child pretty harshly, but they chose to live with me. Now that to me is the pinnacle of the justification of unloving behaviour. By saying that somebody chose to interact with you and so therefore they deserved your unloving behaviour is the pinnacle of unloving behaviour itself. Yeah. And I've heard many people who believe in reincarnation say exactly that thing to me. Yeah. So, so what we need to do is we need to start seeing the world differently. We need to start seeing it as everything that I, I can change everything right now. I can make a different choice right now. Right now. I don't have to put off my choices. The only reason why I would put off a choice to be, do something loving is because of fear. The only reason why I'd put off a choice to do something more truthful is because of fear. Why would I choose such a thing? Why would I choose to remain in fear? The only reason why I choose to remain in fear is because I have emotions in me that justify my fear. That's the only reason why I do it. And I need to start confronting those emotions so that I can become more loving. And this little child who's been attracted into my life is a perfect individual to help me confront those emotions, to confront the unloving behaviours that I have. That's the beauty of it. And that's the beauty of the system. So it sort of brings us... Is that okay if I've answered that? And if that, that brings us to this question of how the law of attraction actually refines our condition of love. What it does is this, and in a general sense, and then I'll be more specific. What it does is this. Here's myself. Uh, uh, got a few broken bones there, obviously. And uh, so this is me. And I'm in a certain condition, whatever that condition is. Now, God has made this law so that I attract an event... And the event can be so simple, like it can be just like a mosquito biting you. Just an event. Right? Just a tiny little event like that. Every event has its course. And I attract this event, and then out of that event, I have a choice. I have a choice to learn more about love or a choice to be unloving. That's my choice. So let's put it in the same tense. Yeah. That's my choice. Every single event. So a mosquito comes along, bites my arm, I have a choice. And it's not an intellectual choice. Remember, because we said the mind is not involved in the soul's attractions. Right? So this is to do with emotions and feelings and beliefs and all these other things that are all inbuilt with this emotionally. There's a lot of times we even believe we know certain things that here our life is telling us we don't know them yet. So how many of you would say you trust your partner but sometimes here you don't feel trust of your partner, for example? Can you see how sometimes what you think, what you, think you think is very different to what 
you feel in the same circumstance. And this is what I'm saying, it's what you feel, what the emotions are, the soul condition, the underlying soul condition that attracts the event and the soul has the choice to either become more loving or become more unloving in the way that it responds to this event. And therefore, if I understand that the event is attracted to me because it's my soul condition that attracts the event, then it's going to, I, I can then go, okay, I can find the cause of this event. Yeah. So, mosquito comes along and bites me. Most people just you know, get rid of that life. That's not very conducive to uh, my happiness. And, and there's the event, we, and we don't even think of it. And then, you know, after a while, you, you have another mosquito and another mosquito and another mosquito, and then you go, I always get bitten by mosquitoes. It's now really annoying me. <laughs> All right? Now I'm starting to become more conscious. There's some reason why this is happening. And it's not that Daddy told you that they love your blood because you've got sweet blood or anything like that. It's none of those things, as you well know, right? So it's something to do with something serious that's going on inside of your soul. So you'd have to feel your way through that to find out what it is. But most of the time it will be linked to how unloving you are towards yourself. So there's going to be some interactions between how unloving you are towards yourself and therefore the insects and other things that are a part of nature feel that it's okay to come and eat you or bite you or take a bit of your blood. Yeah. Because of how unloving you are towards yourself, you will allow that treatment of, from others or from other animals or insects or other living creatures. So what I would do then is go, you know, insects always biting me. What's my rest of my life like when I interact with people? <laughs> what, how is it like when I interact with the other living things bigger than an insect? Do I find myself giving all the time and not getting? Do I find myself being attacked all the time? Do I seem to, in, in, you know, does my soul seem to... In, Attract, attack, what, what's actually happening. And, and we can start working through why. Because at the end of the day, we want the cause that's inside of our soul to be released. That's the point. So the whole point of the law of attraction to, is to get rid of the causes that are unloving and to put in their place causes that are loving. That's the whole point of it. And that when, when we do that and we make loving choices... We then become more loving as a result. And as a result of that, the law of attraction is automatically refining us. Now, that's the general overview of how it works. What we need to probably do is go into some nitty-gritty situations and come up with what's going on in any situation. Is there any questions before I proceed with that? If we just wait for the mic, it's coming down. Thank you. Helen, this must be... If just hold it a bit closer there. And if I turn them on, that's a good question. Can I just grab them and just make sure that I have turned them on? And I've unmuted them. Testing. That's good. Thank you. Hello. Many times it's also like this, what is a loving behaviour? Because for, for me it could be also to let the mosquitoes eat if they are hungry. I mean, they could eat on you. Shouldn't that be love too? Well, this is right. Like, so how do we know what is loving behaviour is a good question, isn't it? Like, is it loving to have a mosquito eat you? Like, is that... that yeah, but for if you feel love for the mosquito then, because that, then it can be, for me, sometimes in... The, and the same if you help, you, you say you, you give to people, they, and then you say they eat you, but sometimes you want to give to people, and sometimes you get used, but if you feel that you want to give anyway... I, and, and but see, if I gave to a person and I got used, then there's a negative event my soul's attracting. If through my desire to give, there's a negative event. So that tells me my desire to give is not pure. Okay. It tells me there's something unloving in my desire to give. If, if there was something purely loving in my desire to give, I would never attract in, in response a negative event. So that tells me there's got to be something unloving in my desire to give. It's the same with the mosquito. If I allow the mosquito to eat myself and then my skin bumps up as a big, great big lump and it actually hurts what the mosquito is doing to me hurts, then it tells me it's, something's unloving going on here because love never has any pain associated with it, okay. ever. 
So, so any time I have love and pain in the, two, say, in, the two, in the same sentence, I'm already being untruthful with myself. The reality is love will never cause pain, ever. If it's true love, it will never cause pain, ever. So, so if I'm having some kind of what I think is a loving interaction and yet it's causing me pain, then it's telling me that there's something in my soul that needs correction. There's something in my soul, there's something in my belief systems, there's something in my feelings that are incorrect, that are out of harmony with love. So this is, the, this is the question. So the question is, how do I know what is loving? And it's quite simple. If it's creating pain and suffering in a true sense, so it's not just imagined. In other words, if I come up and tell you the truth about something and you automatically feel pain, then that, that's to me a fake expression of pain because the reality is that when you tell the truth to somebody, it's never painful if they are open to receiving it. So... It has to be true pain and suffering, but there's plenty of examples of true pain and suffering in the world, is there not? So anything that creates true pain and suffering tells me that whatever created it has to be unloving. And as soon as I know that, that relationship between pain and unloving behaviour, then I know that anything that happened to me that was painful for me, there's something about love that I need to address inside of myself to work through the issue. Right, inside of me. So, so some of this come up and pop, punch me in the nose and I've got to work through myself. I've got to work through. I don't have to worry about him because I can't control his behaviour. I can't tell him what to do. I can't make him more loving, even though he's been unloving. I can't make him more loving. I can't you know, control him in any way aside from what's coming out of my soul. There must be a reason why he chose me to punch <laughs> Again, so I, I need to look at the reason, what it is inside of myself if I want to grow more loving. And once I address that particular issue and grow more loving out of the, out of the um, interaction, there's a very strong likelihood I'll never be punched again in my entire life. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so do we understand the basic principle of why the law of attraction works and, and how it basically works? Everyone's fine with that? Okay, so, so can you see we're attracting an event? And remember, there might be a collective group of people attracting an event. So you might go along to a soccer match and half of the stadium on one side goes berserk. You know, and they have a meltdown and they're in a, you know, they're in a riot. That's an event. That whole lot of people were attracted, not just one person. Right? Then there's other events that are just you, aren't there? Like, that just seem to involve you. And, and they can be very, very simple events like you're there cutting up the, you know, the um, food for your dinner and all of a sudden you slip your thumb you know, and a big wrap it up and whatever and away you go cutting without hardly even thinking most of the time. Um, but that was an event that you just created through this. And it was a, pain, a painful event, physically painful, so therefore there has to be an unloving cause. Right? Every single event is the same. Every single event that we could create. So the event's created. We have a choice, firstly, to understand that our soul condition was the creator of the event. Yes, so once we understand that, we're in a greater state of awareness. That makes us, makes us more aware. Secondly, that we need to understand that there is a cause within us that we can that is emotional in nature or, or has something to do with belief systems or many of those other things we listed. Remember that long list that we created as to what the soul condition was? There's something in the soul condition that caused the event. So we understand that. And now we also have a choice to act in a loving or an unloving way as a response to the event. So, so you can you see there's quite a number of different things involved within a specific event. Now, actions are much more simply created if they are natural to you. Have you noticed that? So how many of you have had to give up smoking in your life? Any of you given up smoking? Yeah. Did you find that you had to try really hard to give up smoking? How many of you found that? Let's be honest, it's pretty hard sometimes to give up smoking. Yeah. And how many of you just said, oh, I gave up, oh, I said, no, I'm not going to smoke, and I never smoked again, and I was happy, and I was fine, and I didn't go through any withdrawals, and I, I didn't get angry, and I wasn't grumpy with any of my friends or my family, and, and everything was just beautiful, and I never went back to it. And how many of you found it like that? Uh, a few of you, yeah. 
Okay. So, so it's pretty rare, though, isn't it, to, to find somebody to do it like that. And to be frank with you, I, I feel that a person who's smoking, who does that, is probably not even them smoking. Because the reality is that if it is you having the cigarette and you having the addiction, every addiction generally has pain when you give it up. Right? And if there was no pain involved in giving up, then it was probably a spirit with you who was doing the smoking. And he was just using your body as a tool. And your real addiction is the spirit with you. <laughs> Does that make sense? And not, not you yourself. But for most people, it's not like that. The smoking is done because we have an addiction and a lot of pain inside. And we sometimes have fear and smoke. Smoking seems to sort of calm us down. Some people smoke because it's a great way to get away from their job every two hours. <laughs> or some other reason. So there is a cause within us that, that we have the addiction now we have a choice to be loving or unloving when we f start confronting the addiction whatever the addiction is but the reality is that if the desire is still in you to do the unloving thing it is very hard to give it up have you noticed that if the desire is still inside of you to do something that is damaging it's very hard to stop yourself from doing it would you agree with that? Yeah? yeah. Um, this is the main failure of most religions, by the way. Most religions make a list of rules, right, that the average person finds quite difficult to actually engage all of them. And so there is a difficulty associated with practicing the religion. And unless you're guilted into practicing the religious laws... Um, it's going to be very, very hard for you to sustain living those laws. That's the reality. There's only one time when it's actually easy for you to do the loving thing. Do you know when that is? Have you ever thought about that? When is it easy for you to do the loving thing? Any ideas? If we go at the back and then... We Oh, sorry, just, just grab the mic so, I can, so everyone can hear. Yeah, when you meet somebody that you uh, uh, fond of, or so if you uh, see a little uh, kitten, <laughs> cat, uh, child, or... So yeah, could you say, different. in summary, it's when you have a desire? You no, 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 it's uh, when, you, when you see something that, that uh, from inside you feel uh, natural love for it. Uh, and for some people, it can maybe only be a little, little birdie youngster or something like that. Yep. And, yep. And, it, and it can start from there. Exactly. So I would say that it starts from, a, in summary of that, I'd say it starts from a desire. It has to have a desire inside of you. But if, so if, if you want to do something in love, loving and you want it to be easy, and I think, Pretty much all of us would love it to be automatic, wouldn't you? Like, given the choice of a loving thing and an unloving thing, you'd like it at some point just to be automatically the loving thing, wouldn't you? That you don't even have to think about it. Wouldn't that be the best? That you don't even notice the unloving thing, even. <laughs> that would even be better sometimes, wouldn't it? Just go, go through life automatically doing the loving thing, whatever the loving thing was. Would that not be the pretty powerful way of living. So how do you create that? How do you create that? When you take responsibility for yourself, so you feel full. Or when, you f when I feel happy and enjoyed and, and rich, I don't mean on money, I mean rich inside, yep. then I feel very easy to give. True, I agree. But sometimes if I feel something missing to me, I get, can get greedy yep. or jealous. Or, but when I feel in, when I'm in love, then it's easy. When I'm happy or f f full, what you say, full? Yes, I know. I, I, I agree with that. So, so, so here we are. We've got the choice between loving and unloving behavior. Right? And what we're really saying is that there are times when emotions come along that automatically make you feel like you want to do the unloving behavior, automatically. 
And then when those emotions are not present, you can automatically do the loving behaviour. Would, would you agree with that? Yes. So, so if you have emotions inside of you that, that you feel drawn into following um, automatically that are unloving in their nature, then you will probably engage in unloving behaviour. That's the reality. But if, if those emotions are not present, then unloving behaviour is not something you'd even consider. So how many of you would consider murdering a person? None of you. Yeah? Let's be honest. How many of you have considered murdering a person in the past, even as a thought, or you wished that they had died, or you wished that they didn't exist, or you... <laughs> so, oh, okay. So, so this is interesting, like... One person is honest at the beginning and then we all get more honest as we go, right? So, so the reality is, what did that thought come from? So it come from an emotion of hatred towards the person. Where did the hate come from? See, it's got to come from something inside of you, doesn't it? So there's something there that causes you to feel that way. Yes, Anna, thank you. If we uh, get the mic still, because... My soul condition. That's where it comes from, doesn't it? It comes from the soul condition. It comes from what's something inside of you that, that generates a feeling called hatred, that generates a thought called, oh, I just wish I could get rid of that person. And even if it means permanently, that would be fantastic. And you might not be willing to do the job yourself. Uh, many of us aren't because, to be frank, we don't want to take responsibility for our own actions. But, but we are willing to be, be very happy if somebody else did it for us, wouldn't we? Under, in that place, when we're very angry, we would be. So, so that tells us that, that at some point, many of us have considered murder, or at least allowed the consideration of murder for somebody else for us. Right? And that came from a cause within us, emotional cause within us. Now, can you see that if you rub out the cause, the emotional cause of the reason why you considered that, then you wouldn't have ever considered it. You wouldn't have even thought of it. They could, they could bop you in the nose. They could take away your family. They could, they could, you know, take your wife or your husband and live with them for three or four years. And they could do all sorts of things and you still wouldn't consider it if the cause is not inside of you. Right? But when the cause is inside of you, then you're automatically going to gravitate towards the unloving behaviour. Can you see that? Automatically. It's going to be very hard to resist. Very hard to resist. And it's only how in tune you are with personal ethics as to how far you'll go with it. So, for example, many of us allow a murderous thought about another person but we, and, and we even think it's justified sometimes to have a murderous thought about another person. But many of, the, many of exactly those same people would not consider actually murdering the other person. But they might be happy that somebody else has. Right? So this is our ethics, you see. You know, so so once we're, if we're in a state of pure ethics, even if we had an unloving cause, we'd never choose the unloving behaviour. Because we'd go, oh, there, there's the thought, there's the thought, there's the thought. I want to murder him. Yeah. Okay. Like, okay, now I've got a problem. It's a thought. It's got to come from a cause inside of me that's driven by some anger or rage. And if it, if it comes from that, oh, there I go, the beard goes again. If it comes from that, then it's something that I do need to address if I'm going to become more loving. So I wouldn't skip over it and I wouldn't justify it. I'd instantly be looking at what's going on inside of me. Now, the event that I've attracted, I will attract events that allow this emotional cause to be exposed. So in other words, if I have some kind of anger towards my dad because of how he treated me when I was a child, and under that anger I would have probably a lot of fear about my dad and Underneath that fear, I'd probably have some grief, uh, quite a lot of grief about my dad and how he treated me, right? I will attract events where people similar to my dad will interact with me. And what that does then is I now have the ability, the, the, 
the causal emotion will be exposed. I'll either get angry, and that's not the causal emotion, by the way. The anger is never the cause. The anger is the effect of you wanting your addiction met. That's the reason for the anger. And underneath the anger is the cause. So we'd need to feel our way into the cause, the fear and the grief. If I release the grief associated with my dad when I have this attracted event, then I will release the actual cause of the event. And what will happen is people like my father will be less involved in my life as a result, automatically. I won't have to try to make them less involved. I won't have to ring them up and say, I never want to hear from you again and I never want to see you again and I, never want I won't have to do that. They will just automatically leave my life because my soul has changed. Everything that happens at the soul level is automatic. So, it, so if I have a cause that's unloving that I do not release, I will automatically gravitate towards unloving behaviour. If I release the cause inside of my soul that creates the unloving behaviour, then I will automatically gravitate towards the loving behaviour. Automatic. And the events that are attracted into my soul will automatically change. I won't have to change them myself. They will automatically change as I address the issues. Does everyone understand that? That's a, when you think about that, and it's true power, you start to realise, wow, I've got total control over all of my life. Absolutely every single thing that happens to me, I can change if I don't like it. Not by forcing change, but rather by changing something inside of me that created it, that attracted it to me. And once I do that, once I adjust that in my life, it's completely different. Now, I've given some examples of this before, but one example um, that I gave sort of comes to mind at the moment, so I'll give it to yourselves. And you might hear this in another presentation I've done if you watch YouTube. But myself and Mary were travelling uh, on a long-haul flight uh, overseas. And myself and Mary always order a vegan meal right and because we don't eat meat and we don't eat um, animal products and um, and it was like uh, you know what airline food is generally like particularly if you're in economy <laughs> it's fairly uh, fairly ordinary generally but then when you ask for vegan it can get very ordinary very quickly <laughs> right, that's the way it is. Because uh, for some reason, I, I, most people have no idea how to use spices, and I don't understand that. But anyway. So anyway, we were driving, we were flying. Um, uh, I think we were flying to, was it from or to? I think it was, it was from England to Singapore. That's right, yeah. And anyway, we come along and uh, we sit down in our seats and the way they handle vegan meals is they tag it to your seat. So, so you know, they sit, you sit down in your seat and they bring along the meals, right? And uh, they bring along all the meals for the entire plane and the only person who never got a meal was me. Everyone else got their meal and I didn't get a meal. And Mary goes, you didn't get a meal. Do you want me to say something? I said, no, 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 just leave it. No, no, and she said, no, no, you need to speak, say something. No, 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 just leave it. I need to feel about why I didn't get my meal. I need to feel about it. It's, a, it's an attraction event, and I have a choice to feel the cause. Right? So anyway, I start connecting to the cause, and basically underneath was uh, these feelings about being overlooked all the time. Um, and, and actually, I finished up getting into some grief about on the plane. I started crying on the plane and I cried for about 10 minutes or so on the plane about just being overlooked all the time and nobody really caring about, you know, whether I've got what I need but, but everyone else has got what they need type of thing. And I went through all this grief and then the, the righteous, you know, when I say righteous, it's not probably the right term, is it? But it's like it is in the airplane. Um, the air hostess uh, walked past and, uh, and Mary goes, you know, asking for a meal, you know, like, no, 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 it's still not done yet, you know. Anyway, eventually about, uh, so I was still crying and stuff, and about 20 minutes later, a guy, everyone else has almost finished their meal by now, or most of them had finished their meal, 
And the male, a male air hostess came up to me and said, male air host, I suppose you call them, do you? Um, anyway, um, he came up to me and said, oh, didn't you get a meal? I said, no, no, I didn't. He, he said, oh, why not? Like I said, oh, you know, I had a meal ordered, like a vegan meal, and uh, I can't eat the meat meals that you have and so forth. Oh, he said, oh, okay, no worries. And then he went away, and he came back with a first-class vegan meal <laughs> for me. And, uh, and so I had my big bowl of salad, and, and it was all spiced well, and it was so nice. Anyway, um, and it, to me, it was just a simple illustration of the power of just processing something without having to do anything. And this kind of thing happens in myself and Mary's life all the time, in our life all the time. We, we, don't, focus on, we don't focus on trying to correct things externally, we try to look at why are we attracting these events? What's going on? What's causing the attraction? In every single case that we have gotten to, at least even a part of the causal emotion, there is an instant change in events. An instant change in events. Because God's really good, you know. God also tells you when you're working on the loving issue. Yeah? Yeah? God automatically shows you this is the direction that you need to go. That's the automatic result of you addressing the issues. And that's what I find too, is that you, you get a feedback system in a positive direction as soon as you begin to address the issue. You, you find an automatically positive response occurring once you start addressing the real issue. But it has to be the real issue. It can't be the issue you think it is. It has to be the issue that's actually there that creates the event. And once you start addressing the cause of that issue emotionally, there is an automatic feedback system that instantly occurs that starts to change that particular event automatically. And you, you see it happening as soon as you start addressing it. We've had so many instant things change as a result, but it's always because of addressing the cause. We've never had a single thing happen, myself and Mary, have never had a single thing happen in the four and five years or nearly that we've been together now, together or with our life, that, that has been good without there being something that we've had to deal with first. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And, and you know, you can have millions of very dark spirits around you and if you focus on just addressing the cause, they will have no effect on your life. That's the reality, if you address the cause. So if we go there, there, and then there. So you, Gideon, just, just here. If you leave your hand up. Uh, Maria. Yep. So I wonder what is your method of uh, getting to the course? My method is the same it? method that a child uses. In other words, not much of a method. I feel, in fact, the reason why we create methodologies is oftentimes to avoid the pain of the cause. But if you think about how a child deals with an emotion, how does a child do it? So you, like, you're walking along the lolly aisle uh, at the supermarket and your little child's there and your little child wants a lolly and you don't get him a lolly, a candy, whatever you call them here, what do you call them here? We well, you'd have a Swedish name. Kultis? Ah, right, so candy. It comes from candy, does it? Yep. So, so imagine your, your child's there, candy, candy on the aisle, and you're walking along, no, you can't have that. The child goes into a meltdown. What does the child do? It doesn't care that there's 50 other people in the supermarket. It doesn't care that it's making a fool of itself. It doesn't care about any of those things. It just feels its emotion. Now, initial emotion it felt was anger, rage, wants to control. That's the initial emotion. And then after it goes through that emotion, if you still withhold the lolly from it, then it goes into this, <laughs> you know, sobbing place, you know, and it just cries. And then, and then after it goes through that crying, that really deep gut-wrenching cry, and if you're still in there as a parent, right? See, most parents don't let it go that far, do they? they, they what they do is they go, oh, fair enough, I'll get you the candy and hopefully everything will be over. 
But, but if you let it go to that extent and the child just grieves it out with real sobbing grief, five minutes later, what's the child doing? Laughing, Gary going, oh, everything's fine again. You know, so, so what would you call that method? <laughs> oh, I don't know what you'd call that method. Well, it is releasing your feelings, but it's actually being true to every feeling, isn't it? That's all it is. It's like, like initial, initial response to the child is, is rage. So, so the child feels the rage, and then it still didn't get what it wanted, so it then went into its grief. And, and so it felt its grief and sobbed and carried on. And, and, and if there was no judgment and the child was let to complete that process, the causal emotion as to why it demanded the candy would be gone, and, uh, and then it would never demand the candy again, actually. It would never go into rage again if it dealt with the emotion completely, right? And, and that's the way I use, um, but I don't know if you could call that a method. Like, to me, that seems to be the natural way. Uh, when I look at a child, the way I see it is that everything a child does is pretty much the best way of doing something, um, with the exception of when it's being unloving. So I'm, what I mean by that is... If the child is making unloving choices, then of course there's something wrong. There's some un underlying cause. But if you look at what the child does with the expression of its emotion, it even experiences its own unloving emotion. So, so it experiences the rage, it experiences the fear, it experiences the grief, and then it's gone. And, and the child, straight after that, often will attract an event that will prove that it's gone if you notice what the child does automatically. Like I've seen parents not give a child a candy. The child's gone through a huge meltdown in the shop. The parents been all worried about and all embarrassed, you know, all red and flushed. And then they go out to the car park and the child's now sobbing and then they put the child in the car and the child's now calmed down and it's finished the emotion and then somebody else has given them a lolly. Have you seen that? Where that kind of thing's happened? The parent didn't do it, somebody else did. Like... It's, a, it's almost automatic what the child attracts as a result and because it goes through the different process, right? This is all we need to do. It's the same thing. That's all we need. Can we go, Mary, and then... Uh, oh, there was somebody else here first. No, yes, yes. First. I'm afraid I already have the answer. Oh. It's not easy, but uh, thank you. No worries. <laughs> what was the question? Do you mind me asking? <laughs> do you mind me asking what the question was? I find it very difficult to get uh, to the emotional cause. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm be getting better in recognizing the events, painful events. Yep. And then still, like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, probably from the head, uh, in a, w without losing my face, yeah. probably. But also in private, when I don't, don't risk losing my face, I still find it very difficult to... Um, to get to the uh, emotional cause. And, uh, yeah, can I talk about that? Because yes. it is important to understand what's really going on. You see, for most of us as adults, we have huge amounts of emotional conditioning. Right? This conditioning began when we were very little in our own childhood. So by the time we reach 20, 30, if you're 50 like I am, uh, or close to that, then you know, you've already got a lot of conditioning. Right? Lots of conditioning. So, so the conditioning, what it's done is it's detuned you from the emotional experience. Like a, something that the child would go through in a minute, we take hours or days to even get to sometimes because we're so conditioned to distance ourselves from the emotion. The main reason why we're conditioned is because we are judged. Yes? If you look at the emotion of judgment, both society judgment but also individual judgment that you have, on different emotions, you'll find that different emotions you have more judgment on. So, for some of you, there is no judgment about anger. Anger's fine. Well, why is anger fine oftentimes? Well, it's because anger feels powerful. And so it doesn't feel like we're vulnerable, it doesn't feel like we're weak, it doesn't feel like we're going to be laughed at or humiliated or so, and such things like that. And so I, often anger is a more acceptable society-based acceptable emotion to experience. But when you start looking at emotions like shame, for example, then we start getting lots of judgment. And then if you start looking at emotions like sexual shame, then there's a huge amounts of judgment there. And then if you look at emotions like grief, like here in Sweden, there is huge amounts of uh, emotions about grief. Like, 
we notice it all the time when we're just walking around, just the, the amount of grief people are carrying with no outlet, no way of feeling comfortable to let it out. Yeah? So just large amounts of... Uh, and, and another emotion that's very looked down upon for most societies is fear. If a person's sitting there shaking like this, what do you feel? Have you ever noticed what you feel when somebody's shaking? And they, and they don't have Parkinson's disease. Well, like, they don't have a disease that causes them to shake and they're just shaking. What, what do you feel? Like if I was sitting here shaking like that and talking to you, how, how uncomfortable would you feel? For most people, very uncomfortable. Yeah? And the reason why is because we have already inbuilt in us so much judgment towards specific emotions. This judgment occurred during our childhood and as a result of the judgment, we then are resistive to those emotions. So for some of us, like for many of you ladies, you might be a little bit more accepting of grief, for example. Uh, you may be. I'm saying maybe because many of you aren't, <laughs> but, uh, but maybe. Then, then you would be towards sexual shame. In other words, if you had a choice between feeling sexual shame or grief, you'd always go for grief. Uh, because you have different feelings involved with sexual shame that cause you to feel differently. So, so a lot of these are about judgment. And to be frank, any emotion we judge within ourselves, we would definitely judge in others. And any emotion that was judged in us when we were a child, we will eventually suppress. Uh, so it will shut down. Now, this judgment is the main reason why we find it so hard to feel the cause. Because you could say there's the causal emotion here that we need to feel. So let's say that level is the causal emotion. And then on top of that is a layer of judging-based emotions about that emotion. And those have all been created by belief systems that all have occurred generally within our first seven years of our existence. So they're all very strongly entrenched belief systems that are very firmly inside of us that cause us to judge those emotions that we need to feel. So what we need to do firstly, unfortunately, for most of us to get back to where a child is, we need to firstly release all of these emotions, the, the ones that cause us to judge. And the emotions that cause us to judge are primarily surrounding how our mother and father feel about things. Their belief systems are the primary cause of why we finish up judging certain emotions. So, if you're struggling to get into any of these emotions, then when, you, when an event comes, then, then it, it's, there is a layer above those emotions that you need to investigate. And the layer above those emotions, there's, there's two layers actually above those emotions, which I'll list. It's your addictions. And uh, they cover your fears. And your judgments are all about fears. Right? So you could say they are your judgments and they are your addictions. So let's say, for example, I have a specific... Uh, grief that I need to feel, but I, and I know it's there. A lot of times we know they're there, but we can't ever get to it. We can't ever feel it. So a child would automatically, bang, in it, but we're not. So obviously there's layer upon it. So what the layer above would be a fear of some kind. What are we afraid of? We need to ask ourselves the question. And our fears create our addictions. Whenever we don't want to feel our fears, we create addictions so that we can avoid them. Right. Now, if we now, where did, how does this all apply to our law of attraction? The law of attraction occurring. Well, if you think about it, what God's constantly trying to do is expose through the event that our soul attracts. He's trying to expose the cause so that we can release it and become more loving. But the automatic result will be that I will no longer engage in any unloving behaviour. Because the cause of all unloving behaviour in this particular aspect is gone. So I won't engage in any unloving behaviour of the same nature. And in addition, I'll attract a different type of event. And that will often happen immediately. Immediately. 
as soon as I address the cause, there will be an immediate response in the world around me, in the universe around me, that will actually show me that I'm on the right track. So you can actually approach this very scientifically. And it's very simple. You can go, okay, am I attracting a different event? Now, I see many people say that they understand the law of attraction. And then I ask them, well, what event happened yesterday to you? You know, what a negative event. And they tell me a negative event. I say, how many times in the past has the same negative event occurred? And they say, oh, it seems to happen all the time. You know, like two or three times a week, generally, that kind of event happens. And I say, well, do you feel you've dealt with that event? And they say, yeah, of course I do. You know, now it's just what other people do. And I say, I'm sorry, I can't agree. Your soul's attracting the same event. The universe is telling you through this law that, and in fact I feel it's God telling you through the law, that the fact is the cause is still within your soul. And you're just trying to convince yourself that it's not. Now, if you could address, and, and it's a pretty big if I suppose, let's write it as a big if, <laughs> like a big if. If you could address and feel the cause of every event that ever happens in your life, and release the cause from you, can you imagine how rapidly your life would improve? It would be pretty rapid if you think about it. Because in the course of a single day, how many events can you attract? Well, let's say if you're going to process every one of them, you might attract 10, 10 a day that cause you to cry, let's say. And most people go, 10 a day crying a half an hour each time that's five hours crying a day see i uh, i've already got judgment now haven't i <laughs> i've already got some judgment about that but imagine if you were able to just embrace events like that like a child would and just let how many of you have had children yes how many of you had children how many of your children cried four or five times a day how it's pretty frequent actually when you look at you know, they might cry for five minutes here, ten minutes there, cry for minutes here, ten minutes there. And before you know it, they've cried 20 times a day. And did you judge them doing it? Well, you must have if they shut down from doing it. And probably, yes, we probably did judge them from doing it, and that's why we tried to control them. But imagine if we didn't judge that. Potentially, we could process three, four, five events a day that we no longer ever have to process again. Ever. It's all gone. The unloving behaviour is gone. My, I've refined my love automatically. Four or five events. Imagine the improvement in love that we could make in the course of a day if we did that. And then if we did that every day. So this was the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day. And instead of what most of us do is we go, loving time, we do a bit of loving thing and then we go, oh, negative event, we act unlovingly. <laughs> And then we act lovingly, we act unlovingly, and unlovingly again, and then lovingly, and then lovingly, and then act unlovingly. And at the end of the day, we end up being the same as when we began. But if we could actually address events in a truly causal manner every single day, without actually, and have the ethics to not engage in unloving behaviour every day, right? in other words, not satisfy our addictions every day, if we could do that, potentially within a month, we could be a totally different person in terms of how much love there is in our soul. Thanks, Rick. I agree with you, but I also feel it's very hard. I think I, I cry a lot, and but I, I, I think it's a lot of effect feelings. And I, I don't know how to, to really to come down to the cause. I agree. It's a very good statement that you make. If you cry about the effects, then you have no benefit from crying at all. You might as well not cry at all. And when you're crying about the effects, it's things like this, even a few examples. Let's say you're in a relationship and uh, your partner decides they want to break up from you. Right? And you just cry for three or four or five days, week, month, whatever. And you might even cry, be crying two months later if they were, you were really connected with them and attracted to them and also if you had quite a lot of addictions with them you might cry for longer than that um, and in the end you can actually address no cause at all in that crying none at all and you'll attract another partner who also leaves you and then another one 
And then by the third or fourth partner that's left you, you're going, I don't know, even know if I want a relationship. So you're not even willing to engage a relationship to try and prevent the pain. Now that is a situation where you're not addressing the cause. You're just addressing effects. So the question then comes, how do I know the difference between the effect and the cause? That's the real question, isn't it? The and effect so, yep. to yeah. the cause. How do you go from the effect to the cause? It's on. It's all right. How do you go from the effect to the cause? Very, very, very good questions. Well, can I suggest to you a few things? Firstly, if we are just feeling the effects of the law of attraction and we're not automatically going to the cause, then we have an addiction that we're unwilling to face. Does that make sense to everyone? Can I illustrate that with some examples? All right, let's do that. Here's a very simple, quick and dirty illustration of that. I'm a smoker. So here I am, I'm smoking. I know that smoking is unhealthy for my body. Yes? But I continue to smoke. And then all of a sudden an event occurs where I don't have cigarettes. So in other words, I'm, I, I, I was, I was travelling here, here, here uh, to England on our last flight from Singapore and I sat next to a man who was very overcloaked by spirits, which is my interesting attractions at times, and, and he was very overcloaked by spirits. He, dr he was drunk as well and he was sitting next to me and uh, so it's an interesting attraction for me. Uh, uh, so I had to give a lot of thought to that one and, uh, and a lot of feelings about that one. But he was sitting next to me and uh, he was saying to me, he'd, he'd nudge me every few minutes, of course, um, and uh, I badly need to have a fag, he said. I badly need to have a smoke. He was an Englishman. And he was young, probably in his late 20s. And, uh, and I said, yeah, no worries, mate. Um, can't have it on the aeroplane. He said, you can't. What, what happens if I go into the toilet? I should be able to have one there. And, and I said, well, you'd probably get caught. What happens if you get caught? <laughs> and he, he was drunk, of course, so explaining anything to him was pretty difficult. Um, and then and I said, well, you know, they have fines. They have fines and, and actually uh, jail, uh, short jail terms as well for people who get caught smoking in planes and stuff. He says, oh, I just need a spag. I just need a bag. And he's just going, I just need a smoke. I just need a smoke. I just need a smoke. And, and, and just going on and on and on about how much he needed a smoke. Now... He was in the effect right in that moment. He was upset about not getting his addiction met. Does that make sense? So he's got a law of attraction event in that he's, he's now confined to a tin can, sitting next to Jesus, <laughs> who doesn't smoke either, and who doesn't drink. And he's sitting there. Anyway, he's, he's grinding his king again. He's spirit overcloaked, which is in, like a great interaction with myself and those spirits. And, and, and on top of that, he's badly in need of one of his addictions met. And he's attracted that event. And the response was the effect, which is angry, upset, um, that he can't have his cigarette. That's the event. So it's, it's telling him, the law of attraction is telling him he's in an unloving condition. Because he's not getting what he wants. So the law of attraction is automatically telling him that what he wants must be unloving. Because the reality is, if you were loving in all of your desires, you would get what you want every time. If all of your desires were perfectly loving, you would get what you want every time. So, so there's something about them being unloving if you're not getting what you want. So, so there's an effect. The effect is that he has now been controlled and constrained. He's now no longer getting his desire met. So his desire, which was an unloving desire, a desire to harm himself in particular, has to be an unloving desire. And it has an effect, he has an event attracted where the effect is that his unloving desire is not getting met and he feels, the first emotion he feels, because he's drunk, of course, he's a bit more verbal with it, the first emotion he's feeling is anger. Yeah? Okay. So how does he go from that to the cause? So what, what do you think? What, what would you do, do you think, if that was you? <laughs> would that ever be you? <laughs> what 
What would you do? See, what, what I would do is I'd go, okay, and of course you need to probably not be drunk to do this, but I'd be going, okay, um, I've attracted an event which is telling me that probably one of my desires here is unloving. The desire I'm feeling dominantly is the desire to smoke. So that tells me that this desire to smoke is unloving. It doesn't matter what I believe about it, the event is telling me that. So I might believe it's loving, but, but the event's telling me it's unloving. Because I have a certain degree of pain associated with the event occurring, it's showing me. So what I would do then is I'd be sincere about that initially. So, so I'd go, okay, this addiction I have to smoke is unloving. Now, if I have an addiction to please my addictions without addressing their causes, I will probably not even get to that layer, will I? If I, if I desire to ignore the things that my life is bringing me, I will go straight away into blame, won't I? Probably. So what he started doing was blaming the law, blaming the constraint. He started pushing on the chair in front of him and kicking the guy in front of him, like on the chair. He started you know, like, you know, telling the air hostess certain things and, uh, and so forth and starting to be pretty obnoxious until you know, he slowly calmed down, you know, I had a chat with some of the spirits with him and, and he slowly calmed down off of that track, but that's where he was headed. And the, the reason why was because he wanted to not feel the cause, but instead get the addiction met. Every single time we go to the addiction, we're demonstrating a lack of willingness to address the unloving action. And the law of attraction will actually ramp up in a negative direction. In other words, we'll finish up creating either the same event or even a more intense event of the same type. And that's demonstrating that actually where you're going emotionally is not the place to go to. So remember, the law of attraction is like a feedback system for your soul. So every time you go into an emotion that creates a series of more negative events, that's telling you that emotion was not the emotion that's the cause. Does everyone get that? It's a very simple thing to understand. So it tells me that it's, and it's very important, firstly, to be told these things, to, to understand how it works. So if I'm going along, and this is my, this is my let's call it my emotional state, Right? And I'm going along, and you know how we have our little ups and downs occasionally emotionally, but we generally just skip over all of those because we're ignorant of our law of attraction, yeah? or of the law of attraction, attracting things for our soul condition. But once we start to become aware, we start realizing, well, I have the ability to grow my happiness state. So I start to do that, and I attract event, an event that's usually telling us that something's wrong with my love. At that point, I have a choice. I have a choice to act in my addiction, which will mean that I will become less loving. Or I have a choice of a acting in ethics, in moral ethics, where I no longer choose to the unloving behaviour automatically. And then I have also the choice to address and feel the underlying emotion rather than just feeling the effects of my addiction not being met. So if I feel the effects of my addiction not being met without doing anything else, then at the end of the day I'm going to stay in much the same condition or get worse. And this is what I notice happening for many people who, when we talk about emotions. Not every emotion is an emotion of truth. So I'll say that again. Not every emotion that you can feel is an emotion that involves the truth. Because many times we're in addiction. And our addiction-based emotions, the emotions that are triggered because of our addictions, are all based in <coughs> error. All of them. So the reality is you can cry about an addiction not being met and you're not being truthful with yourself. 
Because that, and that's not the causal emotion. You can cry for years and nothing will change. But no, I've seen people cry for years and nothing changes. Yeah. Could, could I say something more? Sure. Um, um, in mornings when, when I'm doing some yoga, I very easily get in contact in a, with the d- deep grief. Yes. And I, I cry. Um, I feel it now also. But but it never it never ends. So then I I wonder is it effect in a way? Well, no, you're you're doing yoga, you say. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, what a lot of people do not realize with meditation and yoga is the reality is when you connect to so-called deep grief when you're meditating or in yoga, many times you're not even connecting to your grief. You are often opened up to spirits in that state, and you're experiencing the spirit's grief. And if you experience somebody else's grief, you're not going to heal anything inside of yourself. That's the reality. I see many people who are involved in meditation and yoga who can only connect to their emotions when they're meditating or doing yoga. And the reality is both things can be helpful, perhaps, but, but not if we're using them to avoid or we're using them to have spirits experience their emotions through us. Many of us, when we go into some kind of meditative state or yoga-based state, where we're doing something with ourselves, we go out of our own body to a degree when we begin it. And as soon as we do that, a spirit comes, experiences their emotions through us, we're open to the experience, they experience the emotions through it, and we're open to the experience because we'd rather experience their emotion than we would our own. Many of us would rather do that. Many of you would rather cry about something that happened to somebody else than you would rather cr- than cry about something that's happened to you. Does that make sense? And so for that reason, you step away from yourself and you've now got a spirit experiencing their feelings through you and the next day you do the same and the next day you do the same, the next day you do the same and the reality is you believe it's deep grief but it's not yours. And if it's not yours, it can't heal anything. So maybe I'm carrying someone else's grief uh, spirits with you who who have grief and when you do your yoga you are open to the the connection with them you allow yourself to grief because it's their grief not yours so so this is all about just letting somebody else have their grief through you without uh, connecting to your own but there must be something in me that they could attach to of course of course yes There is a, of course, uh, this is what we understand, the law of attraction is showing you that the fact that this is happening over and over again, something is wrong. So so please understand with the law of attraction, it is perfect. It's perfect. If you're actually addressing a cause or emotion inside of yourself, you will have an instant response in your life. Your life will change if you address a cause. If your life doesn't change, then you have not addressed the cause. Everyone gets that? It's a very simple truth. So so, so if my life doesn't change, so I I have the grief in the morning when I'm doing my yoga and and my life didn't change, then that tells me that it wasn't my grief. It was something else going on, whatever that was. And we don't even really need to know what it is. We just need to stop fooling ourselves that it's actually helping us, right? Because if it doesn't change my life, it hasn't helped me. I see many people engage walks of spirituality where they, you know, gauge a path of spirituality, but their life doesn't change. And if your life doesn't change, then it's not helping you. It'd be better off just not engaging it. <laughs> Can you see? It, it, Often this is the problem is that we, we go through our life engaging different spiritual, spiritual you know, belief systems. We engage the belief system, nothing changes in my life. Engage the belief system, nothing changes in my life. Nothing changes in my life. And at the end we've tried 100 belief systems. How many of you have tried 20 or 15? You know, on the course of a life, often that's the case, right? And nothing changed our, in our life. So, so for example... How many of you engaged the belief system, right? You were working along in your life and you engaged the belief system and you automat- and through engaging the belief system, you, you met a partner and the loving relationship with your partner just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew and just keeps growing and it's still growing. 
Not me. Nobody. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Mary reckons she did. Okay. So. So, isn't that interesting? So that tells you, and remember, it has to be soul-based changes. It's belief systems that are here mean nothing, don't they? You, you can believe all you want with your mind, but nothing's going to really change unless it's in your soul. It's your soul that causes the law of attraction to operate. So, so the reality is, we should be, in our process of our life, if we're truly engaging this principle... We should see that if our life is remaining like this, no matter what belief system we choose, in other words, I'm now not with my soulmate and in a very happy relationship and I'm now, you know, after engaging all these belief systems, I have all these changes, my life's abundant, I get to meet lots of lovely people and beautiful things happen in my life and it's happening more and more and more like that and my life is growing in that way, I'm meeting more people as well. In other words, I'm not withdrawing from life and I'm not becoming a hermit for all this to happen, but I'm actually engaging the world and it's all happening. And all of these things are happening naturally. Then there's a good feedback system telling you that your belief system is actually in harmony with love. But if you engage all of these belief systems and, and even belief systems can be in harmony with love with you engaging them with your mind, but if you don't engage them with your soul then nothing will change. So you can learn as much of the truth of the universe as your mind can absorb. And if you don't change something in your heart, nothing's going to change. That's the reality. And the law of attraction will prove that to you as well, by the way, because nothing will change in your life. It's only when you start engaging things at the soul level, you address the cause of something. So there you address the cause your life will become happier as a result and more automatically loving. It will be more automatically loving in that area. And then you go along for a while and then you find another cause that you find and you deal with that cause. Now your life becomes more automatically loving again. You know what we've found uh, often with many of our travels is um, there are many women are interested in spiritual things, Right? Many, many of the audience here are women, yes? Probably two-thirds here would be women, maybe. Many women are interested in spiritual things. But we also notice that many women are also in unhappy relationships or without a relationship. And I go, hmm, interesting attraction. What is that telling you? It's telling you that there must be unloving feelings that you have towards the opposite gender. Does that make sense? There's got to be. Otherwise, you would be attracting your, a loving partner into your life and, and the fact that it's not happening, there's got to be a problem. But what do many women do? What we've found in our discussions, many women go, yeah, there's not many good men around. <laughs> That's what we find, actually, is the cause in their mind as to what's happening. But the reality is that's not the cause. The cause is something inside of ourselves right so every time we address the cause there will be an improvement in the happiness and also in the love that I am capable of expressing I will automatically find myself being able to be more loving without having to try hard to do it yeah? anything that is something you've got to try hard to do, while it may be good, it's not in the end a part of your soul yet. Because once it's a part of your soul, you won't have to try hard to do it. Right? I don't, this applies to almost every area of activity you can engage. Like a person who's great at tennis and really engaged in their soul can play tennis really well without even thinking. They have what people or sportsmen often call a natural feel. They even can predict where the other person is going to hit the ball and seem to be there at the point because they're so connected with their soul and, and, and the other person's soul in terms of anticipation. That's because they've, in that particular area of their life, embraced their passion and done it in a loving way. 
in that particular area. It doesn't mean in all areas. It's just in the particular areas that bring them satisfaction. The, tr the reality is we can address causes in our life that address all areas of our life. And the reality, reality is that every single area of our life can become happy. But only if we actually emotionally address the cause. However, if we actually focus on our addictions and we cry because of our addictions not being met, or we're involved in codependent relationships where we meet other people's addictions all the time, then we're going to find that our happiness levels will constantly like so yes at the back uh, yeah I think mo most of us uh, would like to address the course uh, of course uh, and um, we have tangled uh, it us ourselves into a lot of ideas and uh, misconceptions <laughs> and fooling ourselves and everything. So it's really hard to, to do that. I, I mean, I think that some people might need a way, a more hand, handy way to do it than just thinking. Because when you, when you use your thoughts to, to, to get to, to the source of the problem, your thoughts we will go into habits and every kind of stuff and fool yourself so you won't get where you want you you will get to your addictions or everywhere uh, and you, you you won't it's it, it can be really hard to address what you want to address can i be frank though the child doesn't do that so so if the child doesn't have to use its thoughts and we do and the child's automatically getting to its emotions and we can't, then we've got to address, firstly, the reasons why, what, what we're doing that's different to what a child does. Yeah, th th that's what we have been conditioned and uh, the habits we have got through life. And those are quite hard to get through sometimes and get to the child state. So when you so say they're quite hard, um, I think we've got to be a little careful sometimes because... The reality is that I've found when I have a sincere desire to find the cause of something, it is actually very simple for me to find the cause every single time. And it's only when I, my desire is not sincere that I find it hard. So, so whenever I'm finding something hard, what I do myself is I focus on, firstly, do I have a desire to really find it? Is my desire real? You know, I say it's real. You know, I say, oh, I'd like to know. But would you like to know if it meant losing your life? Would, it, would you like to know if it meant losing your family? Would, it, would you want to know if it meant losing your friends? Would you want to know if it meant losing your relationship? Would you want to know if it meant that everyone around you thought you were crazy? You see, how much do you want to know? Yeah, I see your point. I see your point. And even even getting there and, and being so sincere, can, can uh, if you try and you don't succeed there, you might need some kind of uh, stick. Help. Help, yeah. yeah. Def I agree. Uh, yeah, th 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 therefore, I, I, I am asking if you have any methods that, that help you to be honest <laughs> or something like be that. Be very careful between help and methods. They are not the same thing. Uh, I mean helpful methods. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I don't believe there are any helpful methods. Well, that is your belief system. That is. It seems to be working for me, though. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I have another belief systems. I have had a lot of help from some methods. Be yes, but you've, but you've just said... See, this is where you're not being honest. You've just said to me how difficult it is. And I'm saying to you that the reason why it's difficult is because you are embracing methods. And every time you embrace a method, it's because of an addiction that you have. You want a method. Why do you want a method? What does a method give you? It gives you a feeling of what? What are the feelings a method gives you? 
Let, let, let me give you an example. If I get a puncture and yep. I want to get rid of, of the tire, get it off and put on another one, yep. it's very helpful with a wrench. If I don't have it, I can't do it. And I see it in that way. If I, I'm trying and I, I really can't do what I want to do, a, a method can be like a tool that helps me doing what I want. I'm not saying that I'm not fooling myself or being uh, something when, when I not succeed, but I'm saying if I'm not honest when I'm trying, I don't know it. And, see, and, I I get a, and I get the tool that helps me through my dishonest, so, so I can get to... to, to but the now you're talking about two different things. Methods are very different to tools. See, see, this is one of the constructions that many of us make, is that we, we, we start associating ideas in our mind with actually feelings in our soul without addressing the issue. I asked you a specific question. What were the emotional reasons why you want methods and you don't want to answer it and you've got to ask yourself why? There's an emotional reason in yourself why you do not want to answer that question. Why, what attracts you to methods? They're not tools, and we'll talk about tools separately. What attracts you to these methods? What attracts you to methods? So I know what to do. Exactly. So that's about control, is it not? You want to have control, so you know what to do. Say, if I want to go to the, uh, the state of, of, of my soul yeah. that, that is creating problems, yep. yeah, if I want to go there yep. and I can't do it... You can. Because God created yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I can. But but if I want to learn myself to do it, I, I, it might be helpful w with ways of doing it. No, not if you're in an addiction of wanting control. No, no, it, it's it's not that. I I, I want a way of of get, no. uh, get, getting to to w what is causing the things in life that that, that I I'm want to change. But I'm saying you don't. Why? I'm saying because you want control. Uh, you could you could be right, of course, bec because I'm just trying. I'm trying my best. But, but, but I don't agree with that either. But Mary said that to me many times, and I've said, sorry, Dylan, I can't agree with you. Many people believe that, but they're not. Yeah, but for the moment, I, I, I can't do better. I, I'm trying the best I don't now, agree with that either. So, so, so w w what should I do to do better? You need to look sincerely at the addictions. See, this is what I'm getting at. If you had fully answered my question with regard to the emotional reasons why you like to have a method, you would have found some addictions. And there's the reason why you can't get to the emotion. The addictions are always the reasons why you can't get to the emotion. You see, most of the time, and it's, and it's very interesting, and, and, and I'm sorry I've singled yourself out in this interaction, but the same applies to the rest of the audience. Every single one of your addictions, when I try to address it, you resist it. Why? Because you want the addiction met. You want it met. Right? When you want the addiction met, you are never going to get to the emotion that the addiction covers. Ever. Yes. Ever. It's very helpful to know that. Yep, I but, agree. But, but if, if one really wants to go to the real reason beyond the, the addiction... Is there a way? <laughs> <laughs> Not without firstly understanding your addiction. No, there is no way. You see, it's like, it's like, here's my addiction. Remember I said this, and I've said this many times before, actually. Here's my addictions. They cover my fears. Yeah. They cover them over. Yeah. They make them look like they don't exist. I know. Right? And then underneath that, there is the grief that my fears suppress. And my fears suppress my grief beautifully. They help me get away from feeling any feelings inside of myself of deep, you know, grieving feelings. Now, if I am unwilling to face the addiction, can you see that it's going to be impossible for me to get any further? Yeah, of course. Yep. So, so it's very important for me then to understand that if I am not feeling these emotions, then it is definitely because I want my addictions met. Yeah. Instead of saying it's hard, see, this is what we do instead. We go, oh, it's hard. 
It's difficult, and we use similar adjectives, right? It's hard, difficult, it's too difficult, I don't know, you know, I don't know what it is. And then, uh, then many people say to me, oh, you know, but I don't know what to do that's loving and all these kind of... These are all just what I would classify as excuses. Yes. To have the addiction satisfied and to never notice what that addiction is. All right? And what I see often uh, with our law of attraction, our, God's law of attraction is attracting through our soul condition a series of events. We go, once we know about the law of attraction, we go, okay, my soul must be attracting it. So we admit that. So we go, okay, my soul's attracting it. But I, I can't feel about what it is. Like I, I can't even seem to feel hardly anything in the course of a day sometimes. And I'm trying to feel and I'm trying to feel and I'm trying to look at it. And then I start using my mind and all those kind of things to try to work it all out, which all doesn't work, of course, because the child doesn't need to do any of that. The child just goes into the emotion, wham. So the fact that I'm not doing what the child's doing is because I want my addiction met. I want it met. And I'm not willing to face that, the truth of that. That the reality is that I am not sincere. The reality is that I don't have a pure desire. I want my addiction met. So many of us, what we do with spirituality is this, and particularly with regard to love. We say we want love. And then we say we want love. And no love's coming. And we say we want love. Now, the law of attraction is perfect. If we truly wanted love, love would be coming. So that tells me that if I truly want my emotions, my emotions will be coming. If I truly want truth, truth will come. If I truly want to feel, my feelings will be present. If I want to help myself in this object, I think it can be helpful if I know I can love my uh, kitten, I can lo love a small bird, and I can begin there and try to make my feelings of love grow. That can be a good start. But see and si sinceri uh, sincerity will, of course, be, be a, a big thing in it. But, but you can help yourself getting to that point by starting from where you are, I think. I don't agree. I know. <laughs> <laughs> You've just used a heap of more excuses of try. Remember I said if you actually deal with cause emotions, you don't have to try. You know, make, make implies forcing. Like a child doesn't have to force, a, a child doesn't, well firstly a child doesn't go, Mm, Mummy's not giving me a candy. Mm, how do I feel about that? Oh, I think I feel a little bit angry. I think I'll just try the anger and see how that feels. Oh, no, that didn't feel too good. Maybe rage is the thing. And then it goes like, oh, yeah, rage feels good. So off it goes and feels good. The child doesn't do any of that, right? So if we're doing that, we're being fake. That, that's reality. If we're trying to do things, if we're also forcing us to feel a certain thing, so... Uh, I know in this situation, such and such said that I must have sadness. So what I'll do is I'll sit here and try to feel my sadness. Well, it's no wonder you can't feel your sadness. Because you're having to try in the first place. <laughs> Just give up trying. You don't have to try. Your sadness will come when you let go of your addiction and when you let go of your fear. It'll automatically come. But you've got to let go of your addiction and let go of your fear for it to come. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, I understand what you mean. And yep. I, I have made my point clear as well. And that, <laughs> that is the tool to understand. That's the tool. Like that's the thing we need to understand. It's just understanding the process. What we finish up doing, though, is we start using excuses. We say, oh, it's all hard. Uh, what kind of methods can I try? What kind of things can I make myself do to make it happen? And what kind of help can I get to make it happen? The reality is if you need all of those things, you do not want to face your own addictions. You do not have a sincere desire to face your own addictions. If you had a sincere desire to face your own addictions, you would already have a list of them, every single one of them on your kitchen fridge. You would know them all. 
You would know when they're being engaged. You would be investigating that process. You would want to know what's going on. You would even see the need to have a rule book as an addiction. Most of you, how many of you were religious in the past, like Christian religious in the past? Many of you? A few of you. How many of you were turned off by the rule book? A few of you? Okay. Why were you turned off by the rule book? Because you had to try to meet it without feeling it. All right? so, so I can make, I can go, okay, let's come up with a whole list of techniques, shall we say? Techniques. I'm not going to do this, of course. All techniques are, are rules by which you are going to tr which you are going to try, because you are still making the excuse that you do the excuse so that you do not have to feel the addiction. You don't have to really you, you, you get away with having to connect to yourself. You get away with having to not do the work yourself. You get away with having to like not have to connect to God, not have to connect to yourself, and not having to feel yourself by doing these things. That's what, what we do. Instead, what we need to do is we need to see, right, I've got this beautiful law that God's made that's my messenger of truth every single moment of my life. Isn't it beautiful? God's telling me every single moment what's wrong with me and what's right with me. Because it's both, not just what's wrong. You know, it's not like our father or mother who only told us what was wrong, <laughs> right? And you'd brought home an A, and why wasn't it an A plus? You know, like a, you know, in terms of a grade from the school assignment or something. I got a hundred percent. Why didn't you get a hundred and one? And that is the way most of our parents are, and, and a lot of society is. We're not satisfied even when we do seemingly everything right. God gives you the feedback system. The law of attraction is perfect like that. It feeds back positively everything. Everything. So, if my feedback system is triggering, bringing me events and I'm having the event hit me, my life, it's affecting my life in some way, the event hits me and then what I do is I go, okay, I've got to try hard to see what's under, underneath this. I'm already avoiding the fact that I don't the, the fact that I really don't want to see. And I need to admit to myself that I don't want to see, and then I'll get somewhere. Right? I need to admit to myself that I want to avoid what the truth is about the subject, because if I already was open to the truth, I'd already be feeling the cause. Right then and there. I won't have to put it off or discover it, it'll automatically be there present, just like it was with the child. The fact is, though, if I have to try hard to make things happen, then I am using excuses to avoid my addictions and I am unwilling to face them. And when I am unwilling to face my addictions, I am going to live in my addictions and I'll never get to any underlying causal emotion. And the law of attraction will keep bringing me the same event, the same event, the same event, the same event, different face, Different person, same event. Different town, different city, same event. <laughs> right? All these same events uh, over and over again, all having the same flavour, same flavour, until such a time as I go, oh, I've had this happen now a hundred times. Well, maybe I aren't changing. Maybe I'm not changing. Right? And then I go, oh, maybe that's because I'm not wanting to change. And that's where most of us have our difficulty. We are not willing to admit when we do not want to change. We tell ourselves we want to, while at the same time not admitting. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel now that like working through our addictions and our fears, is the, that's all the work we have to do. Because once we do that, yeah. we get to our causal emotion. Yeah. But what I see happening around us sometimes is that people hear some truth and they recognise, okay, I need to focus on causal emotion. And then that almost becomes addictive in itself, which people are trying to get there without doing 
working through the fact that I've lived this long and I'm, I'm not there already, so there's a reason. Yes. And it's to avoid feelings of helplessness and hopelessness about actual change because the terror is so great of the causal emotion. Yes. So if you look at... So what Mary's basically saying is here we have the grief, which is the underlying causal emotion of every event that happens to us. And then above that is the fear. Now, some of the fear is also causal emotion because it, it was created when we were very, very young and therefore it attracts a lot of events as a, as a subsequent result. Those two groups of emotions are the key to our future life in the sense that if we are going to be able to embrace those emotions, then it, in our future life we will always benefit from working our way through those emotions. But what we do instead is we create some addictions to avoid both groups of emotions, right? And when we create those addictions, we then live in these addictions, not even admitting to ourselves that they are addictions. In fact, many of us believe that our addictions are the most loving thing we could do. We've convinced ourselves of that fact, what we call a fact. And the reason why we do that is because we are unwilling to see one truth, and that is if we're not already feeling these emotions, then it's because we don't want to. Makes sense, doesn't it? When do you not do what you don't want? When do you do what you want? Like most of us finish up doing what we want a lot, don't we? As soon as you want to go down to have a drink, don't you go? As soon as you want to have something to eat, don't you get up and make yourself something to eat? So if you really wanted to feel your emotions of fear and grief, wouldn't you already be feeling them? Why do we think that that's any different than going and getting something to eat? Do you, if you want to give your partner a kiss, don't you just get up and go and give them a kiss? Do you delay it? Generally not. So if you do all of those things with the things you do want, and then you say, oh, it's too hard to feel these things, what does that tell you? It tells you you don't want them yet. So I'd be working on why I don't want them. That's what I'd be looking at. Like, why don't I want them? And sometimes why is, is quite complex. So, so for example... Why don't I want my fear? Well, other people will laugh at me if I feel my fear in front of them. I'll feel like I'm weak if I feel my fear. I'll feel afraid. And, there, and there's a belief in many people that if they start feeling afraid, it will never end. Right? I, I feel like my emotions will never end is another, another general fear. These are all belief systems that I have to address. Right? Once I address them, I'll feel my fear. I'll have a pure desire, a burning desire in me to feel it. I will. Now, babe, probably your experience here would be good to relate because it's taken you around about four years of sincere work, working through your addictions to get to the point where, where you're starting to feel these emotions and want to feel them, isn't it? Would yep. you say that? Yep, certainly. And I went through many times in the beginning of wanting a method and a technique or something that would just get me to the grief that I knew intellectually was there because I felt so helpless and so resistive to feeling uncomfortable, feeling frightened, feeling that things were outside of my control, which was all my addictions. So you wanted yeah. control? Yep. You wanted to feel safe? You wanted... Do you want to list some uh, of the other things? I wanted want? to feel liked by everyone. It, right, that was very big and still uh, has been still, very big for Mary, yeah. wanting to be liked and so therefore not getting into certain emotions. Because if I, she did, yes, yeah, sorry. Yep. I associated that with safety. Yep. Um, yep. I wanted to not feel like I was um, crazy or. So, so uh, yeah. sane? Sane. You wanted to feel sane? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I wanted to. Um, uh, they're probably my four biggest addictions, I would say. Yeah. So whenever one of those addictions were triggered, did you want to feel your fear? No. No. Or your grief? No. And what would you do instead? Get angry. Get angry. Every time? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. 
until yeah. I, and that's what I had to just really get real with myself about those addictions, yeah. about the fact that they existed, and did I really want, to how, did them. I want God more than I wanted control, safety, being liked, and feeling sane? So you had to get those and say, are those as important to me as God? Yeah. And uh, and uh, are those as important to me as becoming more loving? Yeah. And and then you had to start giving some of these up, didn't and, you? And that was an emotional process. So I wasn't yeah. processing causal emotion, but I certainly went through pain through that process of giving up those addictions, yeah. which is another part of this process that we're talking about, isn't it? So you had to notice every time you wanted control. You had yeah. to see an event that caused a lack of control. In yeah. your life. So Ma- yeah. Mary has had in the last four years many events <laughs> which have... Which she has attracted, beautiful yes. soul, attracting these events. Very powerful. Yeah. And you've attracted many events where you've felt unsafe, out of control, like not that being nobody liked. liked me. Yeah. yeah. So we had whole media attack in Australia. Well, that helped her to not to <laughs> about the not being liked emotion, yes. Um, so the, these are all events that we attract to address p- specific emotions. And once you started going through those emotions... Well, and that's the... the I've jokingly said before that I felt like I was addicted to a drug, a substance. When yeah. I realised I, these emotions, I, I want to feel control, safe, liked, sane. And when that, when just recognising that and saying, OK, I'm going to challenge that, then when I challenged it physically in my life, the feelings were so, like, pain... Like, I really recognised how addicted I was to those things. Yeah. And then by going through that process of letting those things go, automatically my fear and grief just popped up. I did, all this effort I'd done in the beginning, trying to get to grief, going to body workers, breathing, stay in my body, d- you know, no, I know methods. what it is, journal, 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 all those Yoga. things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all that stuff. Just I hardly do any of that anymore because... Yeah. I just recognised that it was all about addictions. And once I'm through my terror, I know my causal emotion, my grief will just come out of me easily. Yeah. And also, I'm a lot more at peace with this process. Yeah. I used to berate myself about not getting to my causal emotion. And struggle and feel, and yeah. feel self-attacking. Yes. Mm. But when you recognise how much damage is in you and how, how conditioned we are to staying away from it... Yeah then if you emotionally decide to love yourself through that process, you can give yeah. yourself time, yeah. yeah. Exactly. But not make excuses for the you addiction. You won't make excuses, yes. Yeah. Yep. So in our house, excuses are just not on. <laughs> you understand that? We're none of us, let, we don't let each other get away with any excuse whatsoever. Yeah? And, and we are very focused on any addiction that we notice. Every addiction that's present, we're very focused on noticing. In addition, um, and addictions are like this, wanting to be control, wanting control, wanting to be safe, wanting to be liked, wanting to be feel like you're sane, wanting to feel like everybody else thinks you're sane. <laughs> all of those kind of things are all those kind of addictions. And, and if we do not confront them, the law of attraction will expose them one after the other, after the other, after the other, often 25 of them in a day. You know, like, there is another one, there's another one, there's another one in the course of a day. And, and we often go, mm, mm, every time, I don't want to face that, oh, I don't want to face that. One. We're like the child going, I don't want, I want the lolly, I want the lolly, you know, like, and well, I want the candy, I want the candy. And we are constantly like that because we don't want to give up our addictions and we're not being honest. We need to be honest. You know, without being honest, you, you, the law of attraction won't benefit you at all. Because the law will bring you events based on your condition. It will expose the condition. Then when you're not honest about your condition, you're going to go, oh, somebody else created that. Somebody else created that. Oh, that was because such and such did that. That was because he or her, she did that. And you'll never look at yourself. And whenever you do that, you just take away the power from yourself. You take away the power to change from yourself. Anyway, it's pretty late and I've gone a half an hour beyond what uh, I said I was going to go. So I think it's probably a good time for us to stop now. And uh, um, tomorrow we'll be back again at uh, the same time. I think it is one o'clock we've arranged, isn't it, Anna? Yes. Um, just before we go, though, we'd love to thank quite a few people setting up today. Anna and her, there's been a team of people helping Anna. We'd love to thank you for everything that you've organised for us and for the event. <laughs> 
And thanks, thanks guys. We'd like to thank Mario and Karen for the donation of the sound system and everything. We brought some of the sound equipment with us, and but we've managed to plug into another equipment, and that's been very handy. So we'd like to thank you guys for that as well. <laughs> thanks, thanks, guys. And I don't know if, even if we bought a donation box, did we? I think someone gave us one. Oh, there is thank one up you. the back, is it? No worries. So there is a donation box up the back uh, if you would like to. The way we, myself and Mary, live is that uh, we just live on donations. So if feel free if you want to donate, uh, and th those donations go towards our personal living expenses and also towards doing what we do. Um, and, uh, but if you don't want to, that's fine too. You don't have to. So but j just let you know that that's there. There's just some small prayer cards there as a gift um, okay, there's for anyone who wants one. There's some um, people in Australia who made up some prayer cards uh, uh, that are there as a gift if you would like to take one with you. And um, we also have some services I'd like to tell you about in that we can copy every single thing we've ever presented. We can copy onto a hard disk drive for you. Uh, as long as you provide the hard disk drive, that uh, we can copy, uh, but, it, but it's nearly, nearly 400 gigabytes of data. So you need a 500 gigabyte hard disk drive if you want a copy of it. It takes about anywhere from four to nine hours to copy, so you'll have to be patient before you get back your drive with maybe a return address. But we do that for free as well, so if you'd like to have a copy of, any, of all of that material. We also have all the materials available on YouTube. It's called the Divine Truth Channel on YouTube, so Divine Truth Channel. We also have a website uh, it's called www.divinetruth.com. And on that is links to the Divine Truth channel and there's a lot of material on that. We also now are offering a service where we have USB memory sticks. These are uh, copied in Australia. So if you would only like a copy of a few talks and a bit of the material, you can email our office and there's a volunteer person at the office who gets a memory stick, and copies that and sends it to your address. So if you'd like to have any material that we've got on our website um, and any of the talks. Now, all of the material uh, on the talks that are videos all run w we're on computers. But if you don't have a computer, we also do DVD copies as well. But you'll have to email our office for the DVD copies because they're now done individually and because we find it more cost effective to actually distribute um, things by computer than we do via DVDs nowadays. Anyway, um, tomorrow um, we may need to consider continue with this discussion because I've probably only discussed half of what I wanted to discuss mm -hmm. about the law. <laughs> um, so we might do that. But uh, come along if you have any other uh, subject matter that you'd like to discuss tomorrow. Just, just present that to us and we might be able to incorporate it tomorrow. Tomorrow is our last opportunity to speak with you for a little while, I feel. And so... Um, we want to ask questions that are pertinent to your life and also pertinent to what you want to choose to do with your life. So we're happy to answer those kind of questions too. Um, I hope you've enjoyed today. Have, have you you've been okay with today? It gets a bit long when it starts getting to 5.30 plus and uh, so my apologies for making it go a bit long. So I'll catch up with you tomorrow perhaps. Mm. Yeah? Thanks, guys. Thank you.